Romans chapter 8 says, we have been made more than conquerors. Isn't that good news? We also declared from the book of Romans that we are no longer slaves to sin. Sin shall not be master over me. Boy, if you guys don't get excited about that, listen, no Browns game is going to do it for you. Of course, maybe no Browns game is going to do it for you anyway. One of the things that I'm just going to share my heart about, and I trust you'll understand that this has been a few weeks as we begin to share this path of power And that path of power can be summed up in one word, sanctification. This is where the rubber meets the road today. We had to kind of define some things, and I trust that you'll understand that where we've been the last few weeks, and even as we shared communion a few weeks ago, we understood that as a result of my faith in Jesus for salvation, 1 Corinthians says that we have then been positionally sanctified, considered saints and holy ones of God. Now, that's a position of authority that not necessarily means I have the power, but I do have the position. And we've been talking about this sanctification, and we recognize that at the moment of salvation, I am positionally sanctified. I'm considered a saint and holy though I lack the experience of being holy. This morning, I'm going to begin to go further down the path of power, and we're going to look at some things that I believe should absolutely light you on fire. Nobody's excited to catch fire today. But we will. I hope that by the end of my message today, you'll have to peel me off the ceiling. Because I'm going to tell you, that's as excited as I get when we live in the fullness of God's presence. I'm telling you, there's nothing like it. Absolutely nothing can compare to that on the face of the planet. I don't care how cute your puppies are, how much you love your kids, all of that pales in comparison to the reality of the beauty of Jesus and his fullness in my life. How many of you as parents, now you guys don't turn around and look, how many of you as parents would ever say that you wondered what your kids were thinking about you? (laughs) Yeah, that's most of us. And the rest of you that just woke up, I'll include you too. What do kids really think about their parents? This is an advertisement. I apologize, it's not a TV commercial ad, but it is an advertisement and it's only two minutes. But I think you'll begin to understand what kids really think about their parents. Sometimes, we would like to look inside our children's heads and find out what they think about us as parents. So we decided to find out and ask the children to tell us about what they truly love and how they feel protected. And set it up so that the parents could watch. Secretly. What would you love to be one day? Maybe a teacher from from big school. They're stuck with the puppies with the teeth. Turn your bullhandle around them. Turn out the terracolas. I can talk and feed them with fab water. Who is the strongest person to protect you? The puppies. Papa, I'll be a little bit. 
my father because it can lift one half sofa up. The hole can make a star. How do you protect yourself? How do your parents protect you? How much do you love your mum? How much do you love your dad? How does your mum comfort you? Because you truly love your family, you protect it in the best way. I watched that. And of course, it makes me think of my own three little children. They're no longer little. But it also makes me think about my Heavenly Father. And how much He loves me. And how much He desires for me. And yet, how much unrealized potential I have because I don't trust him. Whether you've had great parents or not so swell parents, can I tell you, you have a heavenly father today who loves you and loves you so much. He wants more for you than you can even imagine this morning. He not only wants to put you on the path of power, which begins, we realize, at positional sanctification, at the moment of salvation, but he also wants to propel us forward down that path. For many of us, we're satisfied to just be on the path, but I want you to hear God's heartbeat for you today. He wants to propel you forward down that path. He wants you to grow. He wants you to be productive. He wants you to be effective. He wants you to leave a legacy of impact wherever you go. And I wouldn't doubt he wants more for you than you even desire for yourself. This path of power begins at the moment of salvation. It's positional for us to be sanctified. But it's not very satisfying yet. This path of power becomes very gratifying and satisfying at the moment that we in the Christian Mission Alliance call the crisis. And if you remember me talking about that a few weeks ago, I hope you understand that when we talk about crisis, it's not necessarily moments of distress, but what we're going to identify this crisis as is a pinnacle moment or a moment of decision where you say, Jesus, I'm all yours. Now you would say, well, didn't I do that at salvation? Hang on to that question. We're going to answer that. 
when we talk about the crisis of sanctification, know that we are defining what we talked about a few weeks ago as the timing of sanctification. There is an entire process. It begins positionally at the moment of salvation, but then it progresses. As we grow from our salvation, we get to a point where we realize that we indeed have a monumental problem that you and I can't solve ourselves. Most Christians would recognize in their Christian journey that there is indeed a problem. We aren't productive, we aren't effective like God wants us to be, and we lack power and impact. And we recognize we struggle. And it seems like we struggle far more than we ever experience victory. It seems like Jesus is so distant, though deep in our hearts we have a desire to be close. Deep in our hearts we want to know Him, we want to be on fire for Him, but the reality is that it just seems that He's distant. Now, he might not be that far away, but he's at least an arm's length away, and we can't quite get to him. And I don't know if I'm describing your Christian journey and your Christian experience But to know that Jesus wants to be so close to us that when he breathes, we feel his breath on our neck. He desires that level of intimacy. And some of us struggle. Sometimes we recognize the thoughts that we have. If they were to be broadcast across our foreheads, then we wouldn't want anyone to see them. And we recognize that it might not just be sinful thoughts, but they're thoughts that are wayward and maybe disobedient. Our behaviors aren't necessarily all that Jesus wants us to behave like, or nor sometimes are our attitudes the necessary attitudes that are godly or Christ-like either. And if we were to be honest we would have to say that our Christian experiences are so dissatisfactory in the inner man. We really sometimes don't even like ourselves spiritually. Most Christians, I think, would recognize that that's the state and condition of our hearts. Now, we're on the path of power, but we're at the opening, and the opening of that path, the very beginning of the path, is very, very narrow. And that narrowness begins to open through what we call the crisis experience. And yet, for most of us, as we look at this problem... Just know this, this problem of sin is is not new, nor is it individualized so that you're the only one who has ever experienced these kind of feelings of inner dissatisfaction, where we're discontented with our own thoughts, with our own behaviors, with our own attitudes. And sometimes we feel like we're the only ones who feel a little distant from Jesus, Most of us, if not all of us, have felt that. And I can guarantee you this, if you're committed to going forward on the path of power, you will feel like that. We're not alone. Let me read a couple of passages, and we're going to begin in Romans chapter 7. The Apostle Paul that we think, oh, this guy was a spiritual giant. He planted churches. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. This guy walked through fire. This guy did all of these miraculous things. And we think the Apostle Paul, man, he had it going on. Spiritually, he never struggled. Am I right? Do you ever feel that way? It's amazing how some people feel that way of me. And they go, well, you're a pastor. You have a get-out-of-jail-free card. And sometimes I have to admit, guys, I don't like myself very well because I know my thoughts. I know my behaviors. Sometimes I'm not very proud of myself. The Apostle Paul wasn't any different. 
He says in Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 15, that which I am doing, I do not understand. Isn't that a mouthful? Where's my wife? Hi, honey. I don't understand sometimes. See, I've got scriptural support here. (laughs) The Apostle Paul says, what I'm doing, I don't understand sometimes. I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing that I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. Do you get that? He said it twice now. But if I am doing the very thing that I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Catch this. Look how he refers to himself. Wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other hand with my flesh, the law of sin. Do you hear the struggle? The Apostle Paul is no different than you and I. But I want you to hear something here. In this passage, there are three revelations and realizations He recognizes first, good intentions aren't enough. If you're on the path of power, it doesn't matter how many good wishes you have. You can intend to follow Jesus. You can intend to do all these great and glorious things. You can intend to serve Him with a full heart. Great intentions aren't enough. He said over and over, I desire, I wish to do the good. Most Christians don't fail in their desire level. They fail in the follow through. Realization number two, my deeds do not match my words or desires most of the time. He says also in verse 19, I'm practicing the very evil that I do not wish. In other words, my deeds and my actions are proving that what I say isn't necessarily what I mean. Because my deeds are showing everyone around me that there's a different reality in my heart. Reality is, I cannot become holy just because I change my behavior. Do you hear that? We talked about behavior modification a few weeks ago, and we believe at times as a Christian, if I just try harder, then I'll I'll succeed in following Jesus. If you read Colossians chapter 2, which we're not going to take the time for this morning, but when you get to verses 20 through 23... The Apostle Paul lists some things with the Colossians, and he says, go ahead and try those. He said, as if it works. There are things that just don't work. You can change your behavior, but that's just the external. That was the problem with the Pharisees. They did all of these wonderful things, yet their hearts were far from God, and Jesus referred to them as whitewashed tombs. Oh, the outside looks good, but on the inside, we're decrepit. The reality is, I might have good intentions, I desire to do good, but even sometimes the things that I practice are not matching the words and the desires of my heart. Third realization is, I have to get to the point where I recognize and admit sin dwells in me. Now, I know you didn't come today 
to be talked at and be reminded that you're a sinful creature. But can I tell you, until you do, you're not going any further down that path of power. The Apostle Paul says, sin dwells within me. And he didn't just say it once, he repeated it several times in just a few verses. The sooner we realize that we have a sin problem, the sooner we can proceed down the path of power. The problem is too many Christians justify and rationalize their sin. Until we address it, there will be no power, no effectiveness, no productivity, no path of power for you or me. Well, how do we deal with it? How do I address sin? Well, 1 John 1, nine says that we confess that sin, and when we confess it, that means own up to it, right? When we say to Jesus, here's my sin, I own up to it, forgive me, it says that he forgives me of my sin and cleanses me from all unrighteousness. And if that's not enough, Acts 17 verse 30 says that God desires for all men to repent so that I not only confess it and verbalize it and own it, but I also then repent of it, which means I turn away from it and head a holy direction. Right? Okay. So I know that I have to confess and repent. Confession is the first step, but repentance is something that I want to spend just a moment on. Because repentance requires action and takes confession to a whole new level. To repent then means that I not just label my sin, but I also walk in a way that says I'm going to continue to surrender so I don't do the sin again. Have you ever been guilty of the same sin more than once? Do you ever wonder why that is? It might be because you didn't repent of the sin. To confess it means that I recognize it, I admit it, but to repent means I turn my back on it, and now I'm walking a different direction. See, here's the thing. If I want to go to Norwalk, I better go this way. Right? And then it goes that way. But I have to head down 162 first. Thanks, Caleb. He's going as the crow flies. But listen, if I'm heading to Norwalk, I don't go this way. Unless you're like someone I knew. I don't know if I told you this, but this this gal, just pure hearted, she had a job interview in Cleveland, and she told me she had to get up at some ungodly earthly hour in the morning. I said, why are you getting up so early? She goes, well, I have to get to Cleveland for my job interview. I said, why are you leaving five hours early? She goes, that's what it takes to get to Cleveland. I said, you're kidding. You know what she told me? The only way she knew how to get to Cleveland was to drive to Columbus first. So she would get in her car, drive all the way to Columbus, and then all the way back to Cleveland. I said, listen, it only takes about 50 minutes. She called me a liar. I said, no, really? Now, that was before the days of MapQuest, and I could say, just Google it or whatever, we, we, ah, and I still don't know how to do all that, but, but you get the idea. Repentance says not just admit that you're a sinner, but would you take a conscious choice and head away from the sin? Now, it doesn't change the fact that our enemy might tempt you to sin, but because you've repented, you're going to continue to walk away from it. Make sense? That's repentance. Repentance is an act of surrender. This moment of crisis that we're talking about is the moment of total surrender. What that means is, we understand as Christians, at the moment of salvation, positionally, I've received this position of being holy and a saint. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church and he calls them saints of God, sanctified. So they believe they're sanctified and they're positionally on the path, which is very narrow. 
But then as we go, we recognize that in my Christian journey, we recognize that, man, I, I am probably confessing sin and repenting of sin more than I'm ever walking in victory, and I find out that most of my life is spent on my knees confessing things. And if that's the case, then let me introduce you to the crisis moment. This crisis moment is the moment that you say, it's an, if I can say it this way, it's an axis point. It is a pinnacle moment, a turning event. When you say to Jesus, I know that when I got put on the path, you gave me all of you, but at this moment, I'm surrendering all that I am to you. And at that moment, this total surrender is this propellant that begins to thrust me forward down the path of power. Because the reality is, I can't go down that path of power without the Holy Spirit and without His fullness in my heart and life. Can't happen. It doesn't happen. So we've got a problem. We call it sin, but we have a solution And you and I own the responsibility that we have to surrender. Hmm, really? Yeah. That's the only solution, guys. The only solution that this entire book gives me to walk down this path of power is surrender. That's it. Now, for those of you that like easy answers to tests, get this one right. What alone allows me to live a path of power, allows me to live a Christian journey that is victorious? Surrender. That's it. Wait, is that good news or is that bad news? Okay. How do you process the word surrender? Good news or bad news? If you're in a war and I say surrender, good news or bad news? Bad news. Because what does that mean if you surrender? You lose. Hang on to that thought a minute, okay? Because I think when you hang on to that thought and you begin to process like many of us, that if I surrender, I lose, you're going to understand then the reality of what the Holy Spirit is going to say in just a second. This is awesome stuff. And we go right back to the Apostle Paul. Because the Apostle Paul not only recognized he had a problem in Romans 7, and he identified it very plainly, very clearly as sin. He also very clearly gave us the solution to that problem. And he says this in Romans chapter 6. And it was the same passage, I think, that Phyllis read earlier. Therefore... Do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. How do you like that? Romans 7, he says, I've got a problem and we're going to call it what it is. It's sin and it dwells in me. So I've got a problem of sin, but now he says, I'm going to show you how to deal with that sin. And he says in Romans 6, 12, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. He's beginning to get to the point. Now, let me ask. Have you ever done this with your kid's parents? If the kid does something, and let's just say he's doing this, and he goes, hey, Dad, this hurts when I do this, what would you say? Stop doing it. Is that good instruction? Sure. If the Apostle Paul says, I've got a problem, and the problem is sin dwells within me, what's he going to say? Stop it. And we go, oh, but wait a minute. Did he really mean stop it? Hmm. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. And do not, verse 13, go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as right, member, sorry, instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not be master over you. Let me summarize for you. Keep those verses up there for me, Jeff. <clears throat> verse 12, listen, the reality is you and I as Christians shouldn't let sin push us around. 
Many of us just give in to it. We would rather rationalize it and justify it. Why is that? Because James chapter 1 says that you and I are tempted to sin when we are carried away and enticed by our own lust. The reality is the reason why we let sin in here is because I like it and I want it. That's the only reason. So here's the thing. If the Word of God says, then don't let sin be there, then the reality is you have a choice. You can let sin push you around, or you can stand up and say, I am not going to let sin push me around today. Right now, by the power of God's Spirit, I will walk in the fullness of His Spirit over and above the sin that so easily entraps me. You don't have to give in to that. And the reality is we have an enemy who's a liar. And he will try to tell you that you can't help yourself. It's a lie. Don't let sin dwell in here. Make a choice. Right? Awesome stuff. So don't get pushed around by sin. Verse 13, stop surrendering the members of your body to sin. You don't have to do that either. Well... I've been guilty of this sin every day this week. I might as well just do it today too. Do you hear Eeyore there a little bit? You don't have to do that. Stop presenting the members of your body to sin as members of unrighteousness. You've got another choice. I used to just give in to it all the time, and then I'd have to find out I rationalize it. But you know what? I don't have to continue to do this over here. I don't have to continue to pursue it. I can stop right here. And I've often said this, as much as God knows that you're heading down the wrong path, he always allows you to stop and turn around. That's repentance. Stop presenting the things that you are, the members of your body, to sin as members of unrighteousness. You've got a choice. Don't let sin master you. Turn around. Present who you are to God. See, that's this act of surrender. That's what I'm talking about. This crisis moment is this moment of surrender where I present all that I am to God. And here's what it says in verse 13. Present yourself to God as one who's now alive. Not someone who's dead. Listen, there are far too many Christians who act as if they can't do anything. Uh, I'm dead. Listen, I want you to see, just like we talked about in those video clips at the beginning, we have a heavenly father who's leaning in going, here's my spirit, I'm going to place him in you. I give you all that I am and I want him to be alive in you. I want you to realize that when the spirit comes and lives in here, something transformative takes place and you now have a power to do things, to act like you actually have a power, right? My attitudes don't have to be the same. My thought process don't have to be the same. Everything changes because I'm presenting myself to God as someone who is no longer dead. How much can a dead person do? Nothing. Voluntarily, nothing. You get the idea that someone who's going to present himself to God as those alive from the dead is someone who is productive, someone who is active and living a life of impact? Present yourself to God. And then verse 14 says, don't allow sin to be your master. You see, the idea is the master is someone that I obey and surrender to. If I allow sin to be there, it becomes my master. I can say that Jesus is my master, but the truth is, my actions prove otherwise. But I don't have to let sin be my master. Matter of fact, I don't even have to let sin be an influence. Because if Jesus is my master, he gives me power over that sin. Are you with me? Okay. Paul said it a little differently in Romans chapter 12. He said, therefore, 
I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, which is your reasonable act of worship. And then he says in verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. You see the idea of whole newness there. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here's the deal, which by the way, let me just say this. We recognize in Romans 12 that we are living in holy sacrifices, right? You know the problem with a living sacrifice? It crawls off the altar regularly. Do you notice that Paul didn't say, I beseech you therefore, brethren, to present yourselves as a dead and smelly sacrifice. He didn't say that. As a living and holy, sanctified sacrifice. See, the reality is, when I then surrender my life, I say, Jesus, I recognize I want to be productive. I want to be effective. I want to live in the power of your spirit. I want to have an impact in the world around me, but I'm not. And he goes, yeah, you need to surrender. And I go, yeah, wait a minute. He goes, no, wait a minute, Doug. You don't have to let sin master you. And you know what I have to admit? I want control. And if I want control, can I tell you this? Sin is your master. And what James chapter 1 says, declares is true. Paul said to the Colossian church in chapter 3, he said, you're already in the process of putting off the old man and putting on the new man. You see, that's the process. Surrender says lay down all of the old stuff, but you also have to receive the new stuff. To lay down the old stuff is to present the members of my body and say, God, no longer is my mind and my heart and my hands and my feet, they're no longer instruments of unrighteousness. I present them to you so that they can be holy and members of righteousness. And I lay that down. But I also receive from you, Jesus, this newness, this new self that's being renewed in the image of Jesus. You see, here's the idea, and I can only say it this way because it's simple. Surrender works. This crisis is the first or the initial act of total surrender. It's that moment that I realize what Jesus declares in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. And people will say, well, that can't be what Jesus literally meant, is it? Absolutely it is. Jesus literally meant you can do nothing apart from him. I am the vine, you are the branches. And we recognize, and we talked with our leadership development group, and understand this, guys, and and let me ask, for those of you that have been in our leadership development group, is it our responsibility to produce fruit? No. Whose responsibility is it? It's the vine dresser, the gardener. Do you realize that a branch has a responsibility, and the responsibility is to stay connected to the vine? That's it. Far too many Christians believe that they own the responsibility of producing fruit. And that's the process of behavior modification. If I just change and do this and do that, no, God wants us just to surrender and be connected to the vine. Because apart from being connected in the vine, you can't produce anything. You can't produce fruit. You can't do anything. Surrender works. This path of power begins very narrowly. And when I'm saved, I get put on this path, but I'm kind of stuck right at the beginning. I really can't even go farther down the path. Now, I might be able to see down the path, and I believe that's true. Because as I look down the path, I recognize, man, is this an awesome path or what? And as I'm looking down the path, I recognize all of these wonderful things are yet to come, and I can see it. Matter of fact, I can see a lot of you that are further down the path than me. I can see that. And I go, wow, I want to be like Buddy. 
<laughs> and then I go, oh, man, I want to be like John Bordis. Oh, man, I want to, no, I don't want to be like Bob Charity. But listen, we can see why, because the path is laid out before us. God doesn't find glory in hiding it from you. Though we're put on the path and it's narrow, it begins to widen at the moment of this crisis experience when I say, Jesus, I know that I'm saved and I have all of you, but right now I want to surrender to you all of me. And I lay myself before you. And when I do that, I begin to let God to act. And he begins to move and he begins to prove himself. And he not only, and this is an an interesting connection. I want you to hear this. See, the reality is at the moment of salvation, Jesus lives in me. But at the moment of crisis, when I fully surrender, he begins to live through me. And far too many Christians have Jesus in them, but they don't have Jesus working through them. Power begins at this moment that I fully surrender. And when I fully surrender, that's when some of these Christian paradoxes begin. We talked a little bit about that in our Sunday school time. Do you realize that the Bible talks about some of these Christian paradoxes? Which, by the way, a paradox is simply a statement of contradiction, right? It's almost what we call oxymorons. Someone said one of the classic ones is military intelligence. See, they just... they contradict each other. I don't believe that, so those of you that are in the military, forgive me, but that was just someone said in my ear. Sorry, I went and get, that was the enemy. He was on there. Here's one of the Christian paradoxes. The more that I surrender and wave that white flag, and the more that I lose, the more that I win. The world outside of Jesus doesn't understand that. And those that are on the path of power but not to the moment of crisis yet don't understand that either. But the truth of God's word is the more that I surrender, the more that I have victory. Paul said to the Corinthian church, if we follow him, he leads us in his triumph in Christ. The more that I surrender, the more that I win. It's it's a paradox. It shouldn't make sense, but it does. Another Christian paradox. The more that I surrender control to Jesus, the more control I have. It shouldn't make sense because we're asking you to be totally out of control. No, I'm asking you to be totally under the control of the Holy Spirit. And when you are, Galatians chapter 5 says that one of his fruit in your life is self-control. The more you surrender control to God, the Holy Spirit, the more control you have. It works. Another one of those Christian paradoxes. The weaker I am, the stronger I am. (sighs) Right? The Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, says, Most gladly, therefore, will I boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ might dwell within me. (sighs) I I don't have time to unpack all that. It works. It's a paradox. Here's another one from Luke chapter 6. The more that I give, the more that I receive. I don't get it how it works like that. I just know it does. You and I ought to live a life of contradiction to the world around us because we are totally under the control of the Holy Spirit. And the life that we are living, they just don't get it. Not only do non-Christians not get it, but those who are on the front side of this path, they might not get it either. And there are a lot of Christians who are criticizing those who are living under the total surrender of the Holy Spirit because they don't understand it. And it's because they haven't experienced it. How can you explain something you haven't experienced? I've told you before, I've used this example in baseball. I love baseball. But you know what it is if you've ever played when you swing and you hit right here and the ball hits the sweet spot on the bat. And it just does something and sends this jolt through you. You can't explain it. But if you've never played baseball, and if you've never hit the sweet spot, you don't understand what I'm talking about. 
And there are Christians who have yet to surrender everything to Jesus, but yet are willing to criticize those who have because it doesn't make sense to them. And some of these Christian paradoxes, for those of us who are totally surrendered, man, that's the fun. Because under the control of the Holy Spirit, man, we can't, can, I'm not smart enough to orchestrate this stuff. But Jesus is. Let me close with just a couple of questions. Would you say you're satisfied with your Christian journey? Or would you say you're dissatisfied? Would you say that you're living a Christian life of effectiveness? Is your Christian journey productive? Are you living a life of impact? Are you experiencing victory? Does Jesus seem distant to you? If you said yes to any of those, or all of those, can I tell you, there's excitement right ahead of you, but you're faced with a decision, because the only solution for you to experience the positive side of those, to be effective and productive, lead a life of impact, experiencing victory and walking, so that Jesus himself is so close to you that you feel him. The only solution is for you to surrender. That's it. To present all that you are as a living and holy sacrifice and say, Jesus, here I am. I surrender heart, mind, body, and soul to you. All that I am, I place on the altar and I surrender to you, Lord Jesus. And listen, that's not an easy decision because every last part of your natural man is going to fight you against that. There's going to be a part of you that says, but wait a minute, I deserve to control this part. Now, God, you can have all the others, but all I want is this part. And until you're willing to surrender total control of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to guarantee you, you're going to live a frustrated Christian experience. But can I tell you, the moment that you decide to surrender all, there's something that floods over you. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. And he brings joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. All of those things that you can't produce in yourself, the Holy Spirit begins to reproduce in your life. All of those things that you desire, like the Apostle Paul, the wishing of the good now becomes part of the doing. Yet some of you right now, I can guarantee you, your flesh is doing some pretty good battle in your heart and mind right now. Your flesh is just trying to tell you that you don't need to surrender. You're doing quite fine just like you are. There's a battle going on in your heart, isn't there? I wouldn't doubt that God right now has already labeled some of the things that you're not willing to surrender to and control of. And right now you're faced with a choice and a decision. My question to you right now, whatever it is that God by His Spirit is telling you, Are you willing to surrender that to him? Are you willing? Now listen, I have have so much more, but I'm going to stop right here. Next week, we're going to talk about what comes after this crisis. The crisis is the beginning of the excitement. Guys, can I tell you, there is so much more excitement to come. We call it progressive sanctification, It's the process of continuing to walk in full surrender. And I'm going to tell you guys something next week. If you've ever wanted to get excited, I was hoping to get here, but I didn't. So you can't peel me off the ceiling until next week. But listen, I'm going to tell you something. 
all that you desire in your Christian journey is possible. And some of the awesome things that God declares in His Word with those who are fully surrendered to Him, we're going to talk about those next week. But you can't get to that until you have a moment where you take all that you are and say, Jesus, I surrender to you. I surrender all. I just wonder, are you here today and you realize that's you? Is there something that needs to be confessed, repented of, surrendered, and turned away from? Here's the thing. When the Holy Spirit speaks, 1 John calls him the spirit of truth. He's not going to lie. If the Spirit of God is speaking truth right now, you have a choice. Do I surrender or do I continue to rationalize? Here's what we're going to do. And I believe Ken's just going to play a a little soft song. It's only going to take a second. Because that's all it takes to make a decision. I'm not asking you to come flood the altar. I'm not doing that. I'm asking you to make a choice right where you are. Will you surrender? You have a moment We're just going to bow in prayer. We're going to listen to this little soft song, and then I'm going to close in prayer. But the challenge is this. Lay down the old self. Receive the new self. Surrender. Are you willing to do that? You can do it in these next few moments. Go ahead, Ken. You play. Would you just bow your head? Because then it will be ready for me to pray, and I'll dismiss us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Even uh, the song is so perfect. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him and in his presence daily live. Lord, we recognize your word tells us in Matthew 7 that on the day of judgment there are going to be many who are going to be disappointed. They will say, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we heal in your name? righteous judge will declare, depart from me, men of lawlessness, I never knew you. God, I want to pray for each person here thanking you right now that there have been decisions made and will be sealed for all of eternity. God, our hearts want to be fully yours, our bodies, our minds, our wills, our intellect, all that we are, Lord Jesus, we surrender to you. And we thank you, God, that at this moment that there are victories being won in the heavenlies that we can't see. We thank you and we praise you right now that the victory is ours through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that through Jesus we can do all things because you're strengthening us. So I want to pray for each individual, man, woman, boy or girl, whatever the decision that had been made just a few moments ago, Lord, I pray that you would now seal that decision and by your spirit would you fill us and overflow us that we might live out the commitment that we've just made. Lord, if we have confessed and repented of things, then I pray, God, that our feet might show that there is a new direction in our step. May there be a direction that changes. May there be an attitude, behaviors that are transformed by your Spirit. As we surrender everything to you, God, we want to thank you that the pathway is beginning to broaden. Things that we didn't think were possible are now probable. Things that we thought were impossible are now possible. We thank you. You are such a great God. And even as we began with a video clip, Lord, I have to believe that you love to hear your children trusting you for greater things. 
So we place our faith in you and we want to thank you, God, that you will continue then to lead us further down that path. That as we progress, as we grow, we'll become even more effective and productive. We will lead a life of impact and power. Thank you for all that is ours. Thank you for all that you give because you love us that much. As we go from this place today, Lord, may we go differently than when we came in. May we go with hearts, minds, and bodies that are fully surrendered. May all the members of our bodies be surrendered to you as members of righteousness. We love you and thank you for giving us all that we need for life and godliness. We appropriate it now as we continue to surrender to you this week. Thank you again for loving us enough to give us your word that shows us the path that our feet need to be on. Now continue to guide us, lead us, guard us, and protect us. For the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you as you go. It's been great, great to have been with you this morning.